Well, thank you all. Good to see you again. And uh, we'll be continuing with the theme that we uh, started on last week, which uh, you might recall is uh, divine attributes in the Quran, for how the Quran presents God. And we're focusing on three particular uh, qualities or aspects of God that are quite important in the uh, in Islam, and we can see by looking at the Quran how those attributes shape how the Quran understands and presents certain biblical figures. So last week we looked at two aspects. We looked at mercy, uh, God's mercy in the Quran, and in that case we considered a couple of texts, the garden story with Adam and Eve. You might remember how God is much more merciful in that text. Uh, comes across as much more merciful than what we see in the biblical tradition. And then, even though we didn't look at it, it was on your cheap golden calf story and how there, too, in the Bible, there's a great sense of fracture and division among the people in the story. But in the Quran, God's mercy is clearly to the fore. Everyone experiences God's mercy. Mm -hmm. The other uh, characteristic we looked at was uh, divine omnipresence, right? And how God, according to Islam, is always present everywhere. And so we saw that very clearly in the Moses birth story, where in the biblical tradition, God had been mentioned a single time, but in the Quran, repeatedly, God is interacting with the characters and playing a major role in that story. And then also with the Cain and Abel tradition, and how God is much more visible and present there. All of those stories are, I guess, from the biblical point of view, sort of non-controversial, right? Because a Bible reader can look at them and say, Okay, yeah, even though there are some changes and differences, I can see my story there. There's nothing particularly threatening or problematic about them. But today we're going to be looking at another aspect of God where that isn't the case, especially in the Christian. And that is divine unity, so the oneness of God. The Quran teaches more than anything else, and Islam teaches that God is one. La ilaha illallah is the first half of the Muslim perfection of faith, there is no God but God. And the primary quality of that God in Islam is oneness. So anything that violates the unity of God is considered to be a sin. In fact, 
it's called shirk or association, associating something with God. And if the, according to the Quran, it's the only sin that cannot be forgiven. And so here is where we're going to look at this topic. And here we run up against some issues, again, especially from the, uh, from the Christian point of view. Because in, in a number of places in the Quran, this notion of divine unity is spoken of in relation to Christian beliefs and ideas about Jesus. Right? And so that's what makes it much more contentious and problematic from the point of view of interreligious uh, relations. Because the bottom line is that the Quran flatly denies two of the basic articles of Christian faith, the Trinity and incarnation, the idea that God becomes a human being. And it does so because it violates, according to Islam, that unity of God. Now, Christian, of course, throughout Christian history, Christians have debated, well, how can God be three and one? And there have been all sorts of lengthy discussions. And so Christians themselves have acknowledged that that's a challenge. But according to Islamic teaching, no, it just is not possible that we can think of a Trinitarian God. And so this is why it presents Jesus in a way that conforms to Islamic teaching and tries to avoid the possibility of shirk, again, or associating Jesus somehow with God. And sometimes it goes to lengths in doing that in a way that many Christians might find not just problematic, but offensive. And insulting. And so that's what makes this, again, such a delicate and an important issue for, uh, for Christians and Muslims as they, uh, uh, they discuss things. A few general comments about Jesus in the Quran, and then we will look at some texts. I have a handout as I did last week, and we'll look at some, uh, some Quran passages. First of all, it's important to note that Muslims have a deep and abiding respect for, uh, for Jesus, which we Christians need to keep, uh, to keep in mind. And again, the problem is that the, the text of the Quran challenges some of those basic uh, beliefs. And nowhere else is that done. But Judaism is not challenged on certain things that Jews hold. It's really just Christian belief about Jesus where this comes, uh, comes into play. The text of the Quran doesn't have a lot to say about Jesus. It, he's mentioned in some 93 verses uh, out of those 6,400 or so that make up the Quran. Now, you compare that with the New Testament, of course, and that's not much coverage, right? There are 89 chapters just in the Gospels alone about Jesus, not mentioning, of course, Paul and other parts of the, uh, of the, uh, the New Testament. But like with many of the other characters in the text of the Quran, it doesn't present a cohesive biographical account of the life of Jesus. So we don't have anything like the Gospels. Uh, that, that, that genre really in, uh, uh, in Islam. So if Jesus is a divine, then what is he according to the Quran and Islam? Well, he is a prophet and a messenger. Those are two very lofty titles that very, very few people in history have had. Uh, but he's not the most important prophet. Muhammad is the most important prophet because Islam teaches that Muhammad brings the final revelation of the Quran. So he is the the Arabic term is Khatam al or the seal of the prophets. There are no prophets after him because he preserves and presents the message, uh, the message perfectly. The two most common titles for Jesus are uh, Messiah, interestingly. I think it appears 11 times. He's the only person called Messiah. But the Quran never defines exactly what the term Messiah means. And then the other title that's more common yet is the Son of Mary mentioned probably some 30 times with the reference uh, with, with the title son of mary and this may be a way of underscoring his humanity right he's not divine he's simply a human being we're all son or daughter of someone right and so this is an indirect way perhaps of challenging the notion of jesus divinity of course we never find son of god and we also don't find son of man which is this rather interesting and enigmatic title that Jesus uses for himself in the, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels at any rate. So he is, uh, he is the son of Mary, he is prophet, he is messenger, uh, he is Messiah, but he is, not, uh, he is not divine. So the bottom line then is Jesus is very special. In fact, according to Islam, he's going to play a role at the end of time when uh, people are judged for uh, final judgment based on how they live their lives, but he's simply a human being is the, the text. And it's important for Christians to realize that 
they do not, this is no way of dismissing Jesus. Again, he's highly, uh, he's held very, very highly, but because of Islamic teachings about God, and again, the unity of God, there just is not room, so to speak, in Islam to accept the idea of Trinity, ideas of Trinity or of uh, incarnation. Okay. So with that, any questions on that before we look at some text and general comments? Uh, by the way, Christians are not called Christians in the Quran. Like in in the Middle East, in the Arabic-speaking world, they do call themselves. The word for for Messiah in Arabic is Messiah. They are Messihi. They are Messianists, which is Christ is Messiah in, in Greek. But the Quran never calls them Messihi. It calls them Nasara, which probably comes from Nazareth, uh, the place that Jesus is associated with in the in the New Testament. We never see the term Messihi, even though Christians uh, consistently call themselves that in, in the Arabic speaking world. Yes, Barbara? I just wanted to ask if there was, if there was any possibility in Islam for a future prophet, or is Muhammad absolutely the answer? No, yeah. No, Muhammad is the definitive, the, the seal. There is no need for another prophet. This is what makes the nation of Islam, for example, the African American group, uh, somewhat, it has an uneasy relationship, or has historically with Islam because it maintains that its founder was a prophet. By fact, it maintains that its founder was divine, which of course is again, as of what, in light of what I just said, very problematic. But that Elijah Muhammad, uh, who wasn't the founder, but who was like the main figure, is considered to be a prophet. And so because of that, the nation of Islam has had a sort of uneasy relationship historically with mainstream Islam. Although certain They've softened some of that uh, that rhetoric over the years to the point that I think there's more of a, a getting along, uh, you know, better better relation between the two groups. But uh, but no, there is no sense that there will be another prophet. There have been a few other groups. There's a group called the Ahmadiyya, who begin as a branch of Islam, and they teach that uh, uh, that their figure, a guy named Ahmed, was uh, was a prophetic figure, perhaps even divine. So we do get some of this, but it never is accepted within Islam broadly. Yes. Um, in my former church, we had a, a series on Islam. And Imam was a senior class. And he made the claim that Islam is the only monotheistic belief. Uh, and I understand why he would think that because we think Christianity is a monotheism. But why do you think they think that it's a yeah, I, I would say that that's a misstatement on that person's part. I think Muslims generally hold that that, uh, that that certainly Jews are monotheists, but also Christians, because Christians maintain that they, they, they claim they are monotheists, right? That they should be included among, among the monotheists. So that certainly wouldn't be a mainstream view uh, within Islam. Uh, by the way, I mentioned that shirk is the one sin that's not forgivable, right, to associate something with God. Even though the Quran challenges Christian belief about Jesus, it never says that, that Christians are to commit shirk. It never says that. It says that they mis they're misguided. But that may be a way of recognizing that, okay, Christians consider themselves to be monotheists, and therefore we sort of, you know, Put them in a different category, but I would say that that's that's really overstating things. It doesn't reflect, I don't think, what mainstream uh, uh, you know uh, Islam would, would hold. Great. Well, let's look at. I've got a handout here again with some uh, some text that we can. I thought it would be interesting to uh, many of the texts we're going to look at are are not narrative in the sense that they're more sort of teachings about uh, or I've got some more here for you. Want to have one? Do you want? Yeah. Oh. Is anybody missing one? Here we go. <laughs> Oh, 
But I thought it would be interesting to start with the account of Jesus' birth here on the, uh, the front side, only because it's such an interesting passage and it raises some, I think, important questions about uh, uh, the relationship between, uh, between Islam and Christianity. So here in chapter 19, which, by the way, is titled, I think I might have mentioned last week, all chapters of the Quran have titles. Non-Muslims tend to refer to them by numbers like we do with the, with the Bible. But most Muslims tend to use the titles, and the name of chapter 19 is Mary, Maryam. And I don't recall if I mentioned this last week, but Mary, anybody know the interesting trivia question involving Mary in the Quran? She's the, she's the only woman. The only woman mentioned by name in the, in the entire text of the Quran. Yeah, we, we do get other women mentioned, but they're always either with titles like the Queen of Sheba or in connection with, a, uh, uh, with an individual, uh, with, with a man usually. But here, this is under a tree. yes, that's what we're going to be reading right here. <laughs> so follow along. Remember Mary in the book, when she withdrew from her family to a place in the east and took cover from them, we sent to her our spirit, which appeared to her in the form of a normal person. She said, I take refuge in the merciful one from you if you fear him. He said, I am only a messenger from your Lord to give you a righteous son. She said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me and I have not been unchaste? She said, uh, yeah, unchaste. He said, thus it is, your Lord said, it is easy for me. We will make him a sign for people and a mercy from us. It is an accomplished fact. She conceived him and withdrew him, withdrew with him to a distant place. The birth pangs led her to the trunk of a palm tree where she cried, Oh, if only I had died before this and had been forgotten, unremembered. Then a voice called out to her from below her. Do not grieve. Your Lord has placed the stream beneath you. Shake the trunk of the palm tree and it will drop fresh, bright dates upon you. Eat, drink, and be consoled. If you should see another person, say, I have vowed a fast to the merciful one and I will not speak to anyone today. She carried Jesus to her people who said, Oh, Mary, you have done something strange. Oh, sister of Aaron, your father was not wicked, nor was your mother unchaste. Then she pointed to him. They said, how can we talk to a child in the cradle? So uh, this story, we have two, of course, two references to the birth of Jesus in the New Testament, one in Matthew and one in Luke. This one is a bit closer to Luke's because Mary plays a more prominent role in that text. But we do have some, of course, interesting, um, uh, interesting differences here, right? First of all, we have the angel. Of course, this angel appears. Notice it's God's spirit in human form, uh, clearly indicating that she thinks she sees a human being here. When he says, I come to give you a son, we, the reader, and of course, she assumes that that's going to happen in the usual way, right? Uh, but of course, it doesn't happen that way. So Islam has always taught, just as, as Christianity, that Jesus was virginally conceived. Uh, but it doesn't make him divine. In fact, the text elsewhere says we've done this before with Adam. We said be, and it was. And so that doesn't really make him uh, divine. Question is, well, how does she become pregnant? Well, in Islam, we have, the text doesn't really say here, but we have all sorts of interesting traditions, many of them centering on this word spirit. Ruh in Arabic, Hebrew, it's ruach. You may have heard that term before. Spirit can also mean breath. Ruh. So many commentators have suggested that somehow this figure, angelic being, breathes into Mary and she becomes pregnant, uh, maybe into her blouse or clothing, maybe into her mouth. There's even a tradition that the, the spirit is breathed into her genitals, uh, because there's one text where it actually looks like that's what's being, uh, being said here. But the spirit breath idea becomes the uh, kind of the basis for the the typical understanding of the mode of the, of the pregnancy, uh, how it uh, came about. Uh, there's also some interesting debate in, in Islamic uh, in, among commentators about, well, if this was an unusual conception, it must have been an unusual pregnancy. So how long was it? Some say, well, maybe it was a you know, typical nine months. Others say just a month. In fact, there are some have suggested it was just an hour long uh, pregnancy, which of course would be great news for many women. I'm sure. <laughs> but, but the text doesn't really tell us. It just says, you know, she gives birth, um, which again is very common and typical of the Quran. It's, it does not give a lot of details, suggesting, as I mentioned last week, that the readers are familiar with the, uh, uh, with the biblical traditions. 
Notice what Jesus is referred to here in verse 19. He's referred to as righteous, right? A righteous son. Also in 21, he will be a sign and a mercy from us. Elsewhere, he's referred to as a word, word of God or word from God, which is quite fascinating in light of, say, the beginning of John's gospel, right? There, Christians have to be careful not to read their own assumptions about what word means into the text because it probably, and not, it's not probably, it clearly isn't meant to, to indicate that Jesus is, uh, uh, is divine. Uh, by the way, this comes right after a, an annunciation scene. There are two of them in the, in the Quran where Mary is told that she's going to, uh, to be pregnant uh, prior to, uh, there's another one in the Quran where Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, plays a very important role. In this one, he's not really mentioned at all. Notice, though, it begins by saying that Jesus, that Mary withdraws from her family, right, in that first verse. And then down later, it goes on to say that she, in verse 22, she conceived him and withdrew with him to a distant place. The emphasis here is on Mary being all by herself. Notice who's missing in this story. Joseph. There's no Joseph in the Quran at all. We do get him in other Islamic sources, but not in the, in the Quran. So the emphasis here is very much is on Mary being alone, maybe meant to highlight, again, the faith dimension, right? The, the dependence on God that is, uh, that is necessary for her to, uh, to survive. In fact, it looks like here in verse 23, uh, where she expresses a certain death wish, right? If only I had died before this and been forgotten, unremembered. Very ironic because, of course, she's the only woman who's named in the in the uh, the text. Uh, commentators have really wrestled with this. Well, what does it mean? Does Mary not believe? Right? And she's she's in the pains of giving yes. birth. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Even if it is an hour, it's still going to be very painful, right? Yeah. Uh, but interestingly, some of the commentators say that Mary's concerned that because of the way she became pregnant. She fears, and this is reading totally into the text because it's not here. She fears that people are going to think her son is divine. So there too, we see the unity theme at work in the commentators, right? They don't want to, they're reading into the text so that they're underscoring the fact that no, he's just a normal baby. There's nothing, uh, nothing distinct here, right? Um, anything unusual about this text? Grab you, especially strange. Um, it seems interesting that it said um, a voice called out from below. Yeah. Not above. Yeah. Yeah. Whose voice is this? <laughs> well, it could be. There are a couple of possible candidates, right? It could be the angel speaking, but from below is sort of odd. Most maintain this is the infant, that Jesus is speaking to his mother, and this is the first of his miracles. And coming from below, that would make sense where even in some cultures today, right? Women give birth by squatting. And so the child would be definitely, you know, physically, uh, physically below her. But it is a curious, um, uh, curious aspect of the text. But notice if it is Jesus speaking, this is a pretty articulate, precocious newborn, isn't it? Because <laughs> what does he say, right? Uh, don't grieve. Your Lord has placed the stream beneath you. Shake the trunk of the palm tree. Eat, drink, be consoled. Don't speak to a nail. If, if, if you see another person say this, the child is, is firing off orders. Though all those in Arabic are imperatives, they're commands. Do this, do this, do this, right? Again, a very, very precocious, uh, uh, precocious child. And so, uh, but that is the, that is the, the, the typical understanding that, that this, is, um, uh, this is Jesus. And then he goes on to say, oh, we'll look at that. We're going to look at that text in uh, uh, in just a moment. Um, another oddity here, by the way, is that Mary is referred to as sister of Aaron. Who is this Aaron? Uh, of course, in the Hebrew Bible, who's Aaron's sister? Miriam. Miriam, which is Mariam, and which is Mary. And so does this express confusion between the sister of, of, of Aaron and Moses and Jesus' mother? Of course, Muslim commentators say no, but this is a different Either it's a different Aaron, she did have a brother named Aaron, or perhaps she is Aaron's sister in faith, something along uh, along those lines. Uh, but but again, it's a, it's a it's a curiosity of this uh, uh, of this text. 
Um, so the, the text ends with the, the, uh, the people of the, uh, of the town being quite shocked at what Mary has done, probably again, because she left, when she left, she wasn't pregnant, she's not married, and now she has a child, right? And so they end by asking that rhetorical question, how can we possibly talk to a newborn child who's in the cradle? And then our very next passage that follows up immediately after that, and what happens? Jesus speaks. <laughs> and it's very interesting here what he has to say. So we're going to look at a couple of passages that highlight what Jesus is in the Quran. And over on the flip side, a couple of what Jesus is not. Okay, and we're going to see that once again, the unity of God is what drives how Jesus is presented. And he's clearly, he is clearly uh, not presented as uh, and, and, and imaged as being divine. So let's see what this newborn uh, child says. Chapter 19, again, uh, Jesus said, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me the book and has made me a prophet. He has made me blessed wherever I may be and has commanded me to observe prayer and almsgiving for as long as I live. He has made me obedient to my mother and has not made me proud or miserable. Peace upon me the day I was born, the day I will die, and the day I will be raised to life. Notice what his first, this is again, these are the first words Jesus speaks in the Quran. And notice what those words do. I am the servant of Allah. His very first words put him in a position of inferiority and subordination, right? In Arabic, it's you've probably seen the name Abdullah, right? Abdullah means literally servant of God. So here Jesus says, Ana Abdullah. That's what he says in Arabic. I am the servant of God. And then everything else flows from that, right? We learn a lot about Jesus here, right? He's given a book, he's made a prophet. Uh, He's been blessed, right? He will observe prayer and almsgiving for as long as he lives. He'll be obedient to his mother. We learn a lot about Jesus, but we also learn a lot about who here. Why is he all these things? Because God makes him that way, right? What, what book was he given? Was he supposed to be given the Quran that it didn't exist when he? Yeah, died? no, the Quran, the Quran says that two, three individuals other than Muhammad are identified as getting books. Uh, one is David with the Psalms. The second is, or really the first is Moses with the Torah it's referred to. And then Jesus is given something in, that in Arabic is called the Injil, I-N-J-I-L, which is probably an Arabization of the Greek word evangelion, which means gospel, Injil, evangelion. What the Quran means by this is in all likelihood, not the books of the gospels as we have them, but rather the message that Jesus was given was the message of the Injil, which according to Islam would be the message again of submission and Islam and monotheism. So okay. Jesus knew that there was going to be Muhammad? Well, actually, yes, in this text, here it isn't as clear, but there is elsewhere in the Quran, Jesus actually predicts the coming of someone he calls Ahmed, which is another way of saying Muhammad. And so, yeah, the, the, the Quran does give the, not just the impression, but indicates that Jesus knows Muhammad is coming. Another way of putting him in a position of relative inferiority, right, to a prophet who's coming along later than he is. Yeah. But all of these things that Jesus is, prophet, messenger, obedient, etc., he is those things only because of God, right? So we learn a lot about Jesus, but we also learn a great deal about, uh, uh, about God. Uh, by the way, in verse 31, we see, he says, he will observe prayer and almsgiving. What are prayer and almsgiving? Part of the pillar. Yeah, well, there are two of the five pillars of Islam. So Jesus is being presented again as a good Muslim here. Uh, someone who is submitting himself to, uh, uh, to God. Um, any thoughts on anything else here in the, uh, this passage? The last word, say I will be raised to life. Ah, yeah. What, what about that? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, many Christian, uh, you know, readers have looked at that and said, "Well, what do you mean? It does indicate that Jesus is going to uh, be raised, just as as Christians believe." But in fact, this is usually interpreted as an allusion to the general resurrection that everyone will experience at the end of time that all people will be raised up and then judged based on how they uh, they live their lives. So it's interpreted as a way that's not meant to uh, 
to privilege Jesus in any uh, any special way. But you're but you're right to, to point that out because that is something that you know uh, sort of jumps off the page for for Christians especially. Oh. It's fascinating because, as many of you know, I'm sure, you wouldn't believe the amount of ink that's been spilled by New Testament scholars who have tried to uh, answer the question, well, what did Jesus know and when did he know it? You know, did he know who he was and what he was, and, you know, the historical Jesus? Because it's not completely clear, right, in the, in the, in the gospel accounts. The Quran leaves no doubt about it, does it? From the very first words that Jesus speaks, he knows who he is. I'm Abdullah, right? I'm the, I am the servant of God, and here's everything that God has done for me. So it's a very, uh, you know, kind of an interesting uh, difference there at work. Uh, okay, let's look at the next, another passage here that indicates what Jesus is. Allah will teach Jesus, look at this from chapter three. Allah will teach Jesus, by the way, these words are being spoken by the angel that is, this is the other Annunciation account where the angel comes to Mary. This time she is, she is with Zechariah and is told that she'll be pregnant. The angel says, she, she you know, sort of balks at that. And the angel says, no, God can do what God wants. And then the angel goes on to explain, here's what your uh, future son will do and what he will be. And so the angel says, Allah will teach Jesus the book, the wisdom, the Torah, and the gospel making him a messenger to the children of Israel. He, that is Jesus, will say, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will make a bird-shaped form out of clay for you and then breathe into it. And by Allah's leave, it will become a real bird. I will heal the blind and the leprous and I will bring the dead back to life by Allah's leave. I will announce to you what to eat and what to store up in your houses. Truly, and that is a sign for you if you are believers. I come attesting to the truth already in the Torah and to make permissible for you some of that which had been forbidden to you. I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear Allah and obey me. Truly, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so serve him. This is the straight path. So here too, notice we have the triple reference to signs here, right? Jesus has signs and he's bringing signs. But notice, despite that little shift in focus, Allah is still behind everything, right? Jesus can do these things, but it's only by Allah's leave. In other words, I'm not the one who's responsible here. It's really God who does everything. Once again, the unity of God, you know, is being stressed here and, 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 a, and in a somewhat subtle way by distancing Jesus from anything associated, could not possibly be associated uh, with God, and he recognizes that very, very, uh, uh, you know, very clearly. Notice that he's given, he's taught the, the Torah and the gospel, again, very much in line with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Islamic teaching. Uh, verse 51 is, is quite interesting here. Allah is my Lord and your Lord, right? Very clearly, uh, Jesus is identifying not with God, but with other believers, right? He says this very same thing several other times in the Quran as a way of, once again, stressing his identity as a human being, as opposed to, uh, to being a deity. And then those last words uh, also jump off the page, but for a different reason. This is the straight path, Sirat al-Mustaqim in Arabic, which is almost a technical term in the Quran to refer to Islam and the practice of Islam and submission to God. So Jesus is presenting himself here as just a good pious Muslim, right? Here's everything that I'm doing, right? God is my Lord and your Lord, and that's the straight path, right? In other words, indirectly, what he's saying is the straight path is not to take me as God, right? But for me to be with you as a follower and a worshiper of, uh, of God. Uh, what else? Anything here in the text in this passage? Right, your attention there. Think about making a bird. Making the bird, uh, yeah, making bird-shaped form out of clay and then breathing into it. What's going on there? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Of course, some of the uh, all, all canon texts 
That's right, Bob, it does. In fact, there, there, there's a uh, famous passage, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, a famous text that goes back to probably the second century. In that text, Jesus makes birds of clay, I think there are 12 of them, I remember correctly, he makes the clay, and then he claps his hands, and they become real birds and they fly away. Now here it's just one, but and notice he breathes into it, I think, in the, in the, in the, yeah. and then he, by Allah's leave, of course, it flies away. This suggests that there probably is some familiarity on the part of either Muhammad or whoever is sort of bringing the Quran together and passing on these traditions about this non canonical, you know, uh, tradition regarding uh, Jesus and the birds. It's quite fascinating. Uh, uh, but did the Holy Spirit descend like a bird? Was that at Jesus' baptism? Yes, yeah, you do get references to, to the, the dove at the, uh, I don't recall, it's in the synoptics, but I don't recall which gospel, or maybe it's all three of them, uh, we do get that. But this is, this is an example of several places in the Quran where it appears that there's a fascinating connection with a non-canonical, non-biblical, early Christian text. By the way, there's another one. In the first text we looked at, remember that scene where Jesus says uh, that the child with the voice from under her shake the tree, and uh, you know fruit will come down and drink and everything. There's a there's a text that's called the pseudo gospel of Matthew. That actually the oldest written text we have is I think fifth century, so it's pre-Islamic, but it probably goes back to the third century. And in that particular gospel. Uh, Mary gives birth to Jesus near a stream, and she's told not by Jesus, but by an angelic being to shake the tree, drink from the stream, and fruit will come, and she's to eat to refresh herself. Uh, so there, too, you know, the, 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 the uh, similarities are so close that this raises really interesting questions about this. We also see, remember I talked about Zechariah. And we didn't look at that tradition, but in the other Annunciation story, Zechariah is presented as this caretaker for Mary, who's living in some, they're living in some sort of a shrine. And every time, Zechariah is frustrated by trying to be a caretaker, because every time she comes, he comes to her with food, she already has food. So he says, Mary, where are you getting this food? This thing. And she says, oh, God gives them to me because God is the greatest of providers. Well, that's not in the Gospels. But we do have in that proto-evangelium of James, which is another non-biblical Christian, early Christian text, that same thing happens. Zechariah is her protector, and he brings her food, but she already has food. And so the evidence suggests here that, that there's certainly either, we don't know if they're written sources or not, but in the air, in the ambiance, uh, in, in Arabia at this time, there are these various traditions about Jesus that are floating around, and some of them appear to make their way into the uh, Quran. But notice, once again, how they're always presented in a way that's going to downplay the divinity of Jesus, right? and not indicate that he's, uh, or suggest in any way that he's, uh, uh, that he's, uh, he's fine. Um, okay, let's flip over the page and get to where things get a little more problematic here, and this is what Jesus is not. So we have a couple of texts from chapter 5 in the Quran. Chapter 5 is probably, I guess we could say, the um, ground zero, so to speak, of um, problematic passages regarding Jesus in the Quran, because quite a number of them address these, uh, address these issues of Jesus' divinity, and they do so in ways, again, that, that can be really difficult for Christians to read. So here we read in chapter 5, verse 72 to 76. They disbelieve who say, Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary. The Messiah said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. There it is again, right? My Lord and your Lord. Whoever associates something, there's that word shirk, by the way, the sin that is not forgiven. Whoever associates something with Allah, paradise has been denied to that person by Allah, and the fire will be their abode. There is no God but the one God. If they do not desist from what they say, a painful punishment will come upon those of them who disbelieve. Will they not turn to Allah and beg for his forgiveness? Allah is the forgiving one and the merciful one. The Messiah, son of Mary, was only a messenger, and the messengers before him passed away. His mother was fruitful, and they both ate food. 
See how we explain the signs to them, the people, and see how they are turned away. Say, will you worship what is not Allah, what can neither hurt nor benefit you? Allah, he is the one who hears and the one who knows. So here, very clearly, Jesus is being presented in a way that conforms with Islamic teaching, right? Uh, do not say uh, three, right? They disbelieve who say Allah is the third of three. Now, a couple of things about this that are interesting. First of all, is Christian belief being accurately presented here? Do Christians say Allah is the third of three? No, that's not. The word Allah means God, the deity, right? God, Christians would say God is three in one, right? Or God, if we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, they are all still one divine entity, right? So this is almost like tritheism here, right? Uh, we have Allah, then we have two other gods. Uh, and that's not what Christian belief is. So what's interesting here is that sometimes it looks like maybe the Quran is presenting a certain idea about Christianity uh, or presenting Christianity in ways that don't really reflect mainstream Christian belief. We also see that down a little bit later, right, where it says, the Messiah, son of Mary, uh, the Messiah, son of Mary, was only a messenger, and the messenger before him passed away. His mother was truthful, and they both ate food. Well, yeah, that sort of goes without saying, right? Why would you have to say they both ate food? Does this suggest something about Mary, right? In fact, our next section we're going to look at, we'll see that that, uh, that could very well be the, um, uh, be the case, right? And so this text is, again, really trying to emphasize the point that no you, you're mistaken when you say jesus is divine but the really difficult thing about this is that notice who's saying it the messiah said so jesus himself is saying uh worship allah my lord and your lord uh by the way notice i've translated this but i end jesus words with lord there you see the closing quotation in arabic there are no quotation marks so there's no reason grammatically speaking that the words that come after this are actually meant to be Jesus' words, in which case, then Jesus is actually telling his followers, whoever associates something with God, paradise has been denied that person by Allah, and the fire will be their abode. There will be no hope for the unbelievers. Uh, they just believe you say Allah is the third thing. All that could be Jesus' words, and then that becomes even more of a, uh, you know, of a challenge for uh, but again, all this is presented in this way because of the Muslim the desire to maintain the oneness of God, right? The unity of God. Uh, and our next, uh, our next passage actually uh, highlights this uh, in a similar way, but even more uh, intensely and dramatically, I think, because it's a conversation between God and Jesus. God says, oh, Jesus, son of Mary, isn't that interesting, right? I've really talked about this before. God calls him Jesus, son of Mary, not my son. <laughs> so once again, even God is saying, you know, remember who you are, Jesus, son of Mary. Did you ever say to people, take me and my mother for two gods and depart from Allah? He said, Jesus speaking, praise be to you. It is not for me to say that of which I have no right. If I had said it, you surely would have known it. You know what is in my mind, but I do not know what is in your mind. You are the knower of hidden things. I did not say anything to them except that which you commanded me. Worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Once again, there it is. I was a witness over them for as long as I was among them. And when you took me to yourself, you were the one who watched over them. You are a witness over all things. If you punish them, they are your servants. And if you forgive them, you are truly the mighty one, the wise one. So this text seems to suggest that Christians or some Christians think Mary is part of the Trinity. Uh, did you ever tell your followers to take you and your mother as gods apart from me? Jesus, of course, could say, no, no, no. You know what I, you know everything. I don't know what you know. You know everything. I told them what you told me to tell them. So, and once again, you know, Jesus is being presented here in a way that's, you know, he is not, he is not the one. Just jump in. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, I told them what you command me. Worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Again, uh, if you punish them, you know, 
they get what they deserve, but you have the power to, uh, uh, to, uh, to forgive them. So what is going on here? Uh, why this possible sort of suggestion that Christians worship Mary? It's funny, to this day, I did it quite a few years in the Middle East, <clears throat> to this day, many Muslims uh, have that notion that Christians actually, that Mary is part of the Trinity. And that could be due to it for a number of reasons, right? Christians will pray to Mary, at least historically in Christian communities. Also, if you go into a church, especially a Catholic church, you'll see statues to Mary and this, this type thing. And so, historically, even into the present day, it's not uncommon for Muslims to but here we see it very, very early. Where is that coming from? Well, there were certain groups, including in Arabia during this time, the time of Muhammad, that elevated Mary to such a high degree that she became almost a deity, like she was a goddess. And so is it possible that the Quran is, and of course those groups were eventually considered to be heretical and sort of died out, but is it possible that the Quran is its uh, understanding of Christianity is somehow influenced by these groups that never did develop and become mainstream, you know, not inconceivable. If so, then what that means is that Muslims really need to rely on, uh, you know, the facts in terms of what Christians believe rather than simply rely on the Quran, because the Quran might be reflecting a form of Christianity that died out and didn't really become mainstream. By the way, the same thing might be said about Judaism, because there's an interesting verse in chapter 9 of the Quran, 931, I think, which says something about Christians worshiping Jesus as divine, and Jews believe that Ezra is the son of God. Who's this Ezra? There's a book of Ezra in the Bible, but no Jews believe that a person named Ezra was, was divine. And so there, too, that this reflects some either confusion or maybe emphasis on a particular form of Judaism that really did, uh, you know, did, did, did take root. You know? So it's a very, very interesting question here where you get, uh, you know, you, you have the Quran uh, making claims about Christianity that uh, Christians themselves, when they look at the text, they would say, yeah, no, that doesn't reflect really what, what we believe, right? Uh, notice that reference at the end to um, Jesus saying, when you took me to yourself, an allusion to his death, uh, there is only one passage in the Quran, and it's our last one, that refers to Jesus' death. And I mention it here because it, too, is related to the question of divine unity, right? The quintessential indication or, or uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, sort of uh, thing that points to Jesus being divine is his resurrection. Right? And of course, in order to be resurrected, one must die. Right? How does the Quran address this? The Quran does speak of Jesus' death in several places, but only here does it do so in chapter 4 in any sort of detail. And the text itself is a fascinating one because of its history of interpretation. So let's take a look at it. And because they, the people of the book, which is a term that refers to both Jews and Christians in the Quran, but here it's specifically referring to Jews, and I'll say why that is in just a moment. They said, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Allah's messenger. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was made to appear so to them. Those who disagree about it are truly in grave doubt over it. They have no knowledge about it and only follow conjecture. Surely they did not kill him. Rather, Allah raised him to himself. Allah is the mighty one, the wise one. There is not one among the people of the book who will not believe in Jesus before his own death. And on the day of re resurrection, Jesus will be a witness against them. The only clear allusion is Jesus' death. But unfortunately, it is totally ambiguous as to exactly what this text is saying. And the key passage is in verse 157 when it says, They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him but it was made to appear so to them. That, that phrase, it was made to appear so to them in Arabic, can also be translated, he was made to appear so to them. They did not kill him or crucify him, but he was made to appear so to them. It's hopelessly ambiguous. 
there's not enough context to know exactly what's being said. Many Muslims translate it as he was made to appear so to them. In other words, Jesus didn't die on the cross, but somebody else took his place. It's the substitution here. And so if Jesus didn't die on the cross, then of course we don't have to address the Christian claim that, that, that he was resurrected, right? Uh, and that's the common way that most Muslims understand Jesus' death. He really didn't die, but someone took his place. And very often it's Judas, you know, uh, sort of poetic justice, right? He's the one who turns him in, and therefore, but you get all kinds of other traditions about, for example, Jesus is in a room with a whole bunch of his followers, and the authorities come in to arrest him, and everyone in the room turns is, is transformed to look like Jesus, and they just grab you know, one of them, not knowing who it is, and ends up being someone else. Uh, that's the way, again, the text is often presented in Islam, but this translation probably makes the better sense, I think, because it's a reference to, again, the they there are the people of the book, but this is the end of a very long passage in which clearly it's talking about Jewish offenses, like the, uh, like the golden calf and other things. And it ends with saying, they thought, and they are so wrong, full of hubris, that they thought they killed Jesus. It appeared so to them. They didn't kill him, but God allowed him to die because God is the one who has authority over life and death, etc. So that way of reading it then leaves open the, you know, the reading, the interpretation that, yeah, Jesus did die on the cross, uh, and that's how God took him to himself. And God will raise him like God will raise everyone else at the end of time. But because of the and sort of the acknowledgement that, you know, the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is so critical for his divinity in Christianity. Many interpreters have gone in the other way, right, in order to therefore not have to avoid this thorny theological question of, well, Jesus raised from the dead. So once again, we can see that in the history of interpretation, it's the unity of God, once again, that's dictating how this ambiguous passage is presented so that it conforms more with Islamic teaching. Right? So, uh, so it's it's interesting. You've got this clear, you know, Christians and, and Muslims and Jews agree that God is one, but because of the that's why I call this the uh, the Jesus problem, so to speak. Uh, because of that problem, there has to be all sorts of dancing and reinterpreting to try to explain it. Uh, we do have a few minutes, I think, for questions. Well, I had uh, read somewhere that the uh, was a reaction to the trick of the Christian synagogue. And uh, in the 300s of where it was, Christians were arguing about what, what how to do it, and they came back with the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. And then the Quran came back to that, right? Yep. So maybe uh, some of these things are probably arguments Christians. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, it took centuries for Christianity to work out, you know, the, the details on Jesus' the precise relationship with God, right? And there wasn't complete agreement, and so it's that. Uh, and it's a, Trinity is a very difficult concept to, you know, to grasp or try to grasp, and so it's not surprising that, and it, yeah, very much, you know, perhaps, you know, that there's an awareness here that, you know, this is a uh, contentious, has been a contentious question. You know, it's interesting, the, the oldest monumental building we have in Islam is the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, you know, the iconic golden dome. It was built in this, gosh, a generation after Muhammad died, I think somewhere, maybe a little bit more than that, probably in the 690s or so, six, maybe a little earlier than that, maybe 650. But at any rate, inside the Dome of the Rock is an inscription around the inside, and the whole focus of that inscription is some of these passages are quoted about Trinity and about denying that God is three and all that, showing that even at that early point, there is this awareness that, that, that this is this is the sticking point between us. Yes. So I said this. So obviously they placed Muhammad in miracles, right? Muhammad performed miracles? Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, in one of the passages before, it says it mentions the miracles of Jesus. 
Uh -huh. Did the other prophets or messengers um, have miracles that they provided, or does that set Jesus apart from the other prophets that we, they believe? Yeah, you know, we do have other works uh, that other prophets have performed that are supernatural. For example, uh, Aaron is considered to be a prophet, Moses' brother, and in the scene of the plagues in the Quran. He too puts down his staff and it becomes a, uh, uh, you know, a, a serpent, right? So we do get these works that prophets prophets bring what are called, yeah, I think we've seen the term here, signs, and clear signs and that sort of thing. And sometimes those are presented as, uh, as kind of miraculous in nature. Are all sects considered the church? Saints? The saints. Saints. Uh, saints Christianity, yeah. No, because Christians don't associate them with God. They don't claim that they're divine. That say they saints are divine. Lord, so. Well, they're venerated. And, yeah, and, and, but 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 Muslims can misinterpret what Christians are doing there when they venerate saints. So, uh, but interestingly, within Islam, this is a really again a hotly debated point because there are saints within Islam. You go to many. Muslim majority countries, and there are these holy men and women who are venerated to such a degree that that uh, people visit their grave sites. They will pray to them, ask for blessings, and that sort of thing. So it becomes very similar to what we see in Christianity. And in, but in some places like Saudi Arabia, that is outlawed and forbidden. You may have heard the term Wahhabi Islam, right? A more conservative, traditional approach to Islam. One of the hallmarks of Wahhabi Islam in Saudi Arabia is you cannot have any. Uh, any uh, worship or, or, or uh, you know, visiting saints uh, graves or anything, holy people to graves is forbidden. They will not even celebrate the Prophet Muhammad's birthday in Saudi Arabia, which is very popular in other parts of the Muslim world. Part of that is a concern with this very thing. Are you therefore elevating these people above religious and making them sort of quasi-divine? Yeah. So there too, you can see how, again, in this case, the unity of God is dictating and confirming the stress on the unity of God is dictating how Islam is expressed in certain parts of the world. Uh, as we wrap things up, I wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, these are three of, I think, the dominant uh, traits of God that we've looked at that, that are quite important. The mercy, the omnipresence, and of course the unity of God. There are many other aspects of God that are central to Islam. In addition, we've looked at passages from the all the passages we've looked at have some sort of connection with the Bible. I don't want to leave with the false impression that the, that the Quran is full of this type of thing, right? I'd say about 30% of the Quran has uh, biblically related material, but there's much in there that's very distinct and unique to the, to the Quran, even if it does in many places have a lot of overlap with what Christians and Jews believe about, uh, about God. I think I focus on the uh, uh, on the uh, similarity only because I think that's a helpful way of sort of gaining an entree into the text and beginning to explore what exactly it is that the you know that the Quran has to say about um, about God and about uh, uh, salvation history as as Islam understands it. And hopefully, the little bit of time we've spent these couple of weeks uh, looking at this material will pique your curiosity enough that somewhere down the line we'll pick up the Quran and perhaps. Um, dive a little deeper into it and get a, a, a fuller appreciation of its uniqueness and its importance. Uh, I have read it, but it's been a number of years, and I remember a really funny part where they were sort of chiding Jews for this business of having to submit a calf or sacrifice that was unblemished, you know, and, and, the, and the Jews were bring this one, oh, no, that's not, uh -huh. oh, this one, it's okay, yeah. it definitely yeah. didn't have to. Yeah, yeah, there are certain, yeah, 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 there are passages in the Quran that clearly reflect a certain, I guess you could say, a bit of tension or rivalry between these, you know, the, these emer emerging Muslim community and the, uh, uh, you know, and the Jewish presence that was especially, uh, like especially keen in Medina later on in, uh, in Muhammad's life. Yeah. Great, thank you all, and uh, I uh, wish you well, and hopefully we'll have the chance to reconnect somewhere down the line. Thank you all.